So I'm very excited to end this very stimulating convention with our final speaker, who will be receiving FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes Award. This re award is reserved for individuals who make known their descent from religion, who are like the child in the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, who tell it like it is about religion. Uh, regulars know that this award was made for us by the company that produces the Oscars. Previous recipients have included Steven Weinberg, the physicist, Andy Rooney, George Carlin, Richard Dawkins, Penn and Teller, Ron Reagan, Christopher Hitchens, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Charles Strauss, who wrote the music to Annie, Donald C. Johansson, who discovered Lucy, Daniel C. Dennett, Julia Sweeney, Oliver Sacks, Representative Jared Huffman, Salman Rushdie, Andrianne, and last year, John Irving. And almost all of them received it in person with the exception of Andy Rooney and George Carlin. This year is a self-described, this year a self-described insufferable wench is receiving it as her Twitter handle is called. Like FFRF, she was born in the Midwest. She grew up in Minneapolis in a conservative Catholic family and currently lives in Brooklyn. And needless to say, she's an atheist. She's also a comic, co-creator, and head writer of Comedy Central's The Daily Show, forever changing the way people get their news. In 2004, and this means a lot to us, she co-founded the late, great Air America Radio Network, which Free Thought Radio used to be a part of, while also co-hosting Unfiltered Every Morning with Rachel Maddow and hip-hop legend Chuck D. She's been named Entertainer Weekly's 100 Most Creative People. She continues to make numerous TV appearances, including on Comedy Central Presents, HBO, CNN, and commentary on MSNBC. A prominent abortion rights activist, she is one of the founders of Abortion Access Front, a team of comedians, writers, and producers using humor to destigmatize abortion and expose the extremist anti-choice forces working to destroy access to reproductive rights in all 50 states. Also, I want to uh, advise you that she has a podcast called, is it called Feminist Buzzkill? Kills? Yep. yep. Feminist Buzzkills. Abortion Access Front calls itself a coven of hilarious, badass feminists who use humor and pop culture to expose the haters fighting against reproductive rights. And before I bring out the emperor, we call him the imp, and hand it to Wiz Liz Winstead, uh, she's asked us to play this video. We love babies, how about you? We love babies, just for you. One in four women will have an abortion in their lifetime. I'm one of them. And quite frankly, I just got sick of these creepy defundamentalists constantly controlling the narrative. So I formed Abortion Access Front. We have the, the gates of hell right here. I mean, we, we have an actual a line between death and life. And you know what? I'm not afraid to say I had an abortion, and I feel like it is my duty to stand up for every single person who needs one to make sure they can get one. I'm Sarah Silverman, and uh, I got involved when it was conceived, pretty much, because it was Winstead, who is my friend and my hero, and I will follow her anywhere. They use humor to make a difference and, and open people's eyes and just get information out, and they make it fun. Basically, I made a career out of using humor to shine a light on bullshit. And what this movement needs is a jolt of fun and provocative messaging to expose these weird-ass self-appointed vaginal crossing guards. So I got some of my friends together, comedians, musicians, actors, and activists, to do live events and make hilarious videos so AAF can drop info about the erosion of reproductive access into pop culture spaces to activate our audiences to join the fight. Our actions are designed to get people involved and keep them involved. Whether it's our videos, our daily updates on social media, or by taking it to the streets, 
AAF counters the lies of anti-abortion extremists with facts, truth, and humor. Abortion Access Front shows up every damn day to put bullshit on blast and to reframe abortion into its proper place, a dignified moral choice. But we don't want to be just some kind of anger fluffers, so we also work directly with the clinics. Okay, four months of the year, we pile all the hags in a car <laughs> and we drive across the country and we visit these phenomenal repro clinics and we support them and let them know that they're loved, they're cared for, and we got them. Going on tour is just so enriching and satisfying because not only do we get to do stand-up comedy, which is what we do, I have been a clinic escort. I've, you know, helped plant trees and paint walls at clinics, and I'm just so thankful that I get to, you know, help in that way. It's everything to me because it's one of the, the few places where comedians can actually use their comedy specifically to connect with grassroots movements like those who are supporting reproductive health. We just feel like we all use these clinics. Shouldn't we be defending them? This kind of support shows my staff um, that, that there are people, there are people that, that will come from far and wide to support us. It's like walking into the light. To have come that far and to have spent your time and your money and your energy and walked into hell. <laughs> you walked into hell. And I am so great. So if you're just sitting there not with the first person you had sex with, it's probably because you used birth control or maybe you had an abortion. So maybe you should join us. We're Abortion Access Front. Yep, we're Abortion AF. We raise awareness, we raise hell, and we have cool shirts. Abortion Access Front, unapologetic AF, feminist AF, abortion AF. And after Liz's talk, she will be available to talk to you at this abortion access table over there. And there's uh, information and other things there. So, but now I'm going to ask Liz Winston to come up and get your Emperor Has No Clothes award. Wow. Oh my God. Wow. Wow, thank you. That's wild. Can you give somebody a naked man in Wisconsin? I feel like it's illegal. I don't know what you can do in the state at this point. I'm terrified. Can you exfoliate? Is that still okay? I mean, it is removing cells. I don't know where we're at anymore, honestly. <laughs> Well, I'm honored. Thank you for this award. It's, um, it's, it's thrilling to be um, given an award from people who believe in nothing. I really <laughs> just want to thank you from the bottom of my believe in nothing heart. Um, I think it's amazing. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Minneapolis. I actually live in Minneapolis half the time, and I live in Brooklyn half the time. And every time I drive to Wisconsin, it is always a joy um, because the billboards are so contradictory. Uh, as you, you know, I, this is the only place where they just aggressively advertise for a porn superstore. <laughs> and I've never understood what a porn superstore is. Is it a place where you buy a pallet of dildos? <laughs> or do you buy just one giant dildo? I don't know. Like, maybe both. I don't know. I don't want to judge. Um, and the abortion billboards are really great. There's just a baby, you know, like Sailor had it, 10 weeks. You're like, really? <laughs> Teeth at two minutes. It's like they're, they're chewing their way out. What is happening with these billboards? I don't understand. <laughs> I'll talk a lot about abortion tonight. I'll talk a lot about a lot of things, but I'll start with abortion, get to some other stuff, go back to abortion. So just buckle up. Because it is, it, bodily autonomy is the one thing that we have. It is the thing we must hold dear because it's the thing that with everything else in our lives, if we do not have that, then we are not 100% citizens of this nation. And so, 
I mean, why the, the government doesn't need to regulate our bodies. We have Activia for that. There's just things that are simple and that we know to be true. Um, and how many of you were here to see Ellie speak earlier? <laughs> Literally one of the smartest and most hilarious humans on the planet and set me up for a lot of stuff tonight. And um, because one of the things that Ellie touched on was this imaginary way that you, you create a false scenario, right? And then it becomes a Supreme Court case or a law. And then it's a, cel it's, it's a sort of cyclical thing you watch. Create a crackpot theory and then write a law that is gonna fix the crackpot thing. And then the crackpot thing goes away. And then they're like, see, we fixed it. It's like, no, it never fucking existed. Like this is this thing that we're living in while we all feel like we are losing our minds. This year in Texas, somebody proposed a law that they wanted to label all of the food products that had fetuses in them. <laughs> Who's this for? Is it for people who are just desperately searching for food with fetuses, but they can't find it? Is it for people that have fetus allergies? You know, the, you know, at a restaurant, you're like, I'm sorry, um, this, it just, you said this one didn't have fetuses. I don't have my EpiPen. <laughs> I mean, okay, the king cake maybe, but like there is really no fetuses in food <laughs> that I can imagine. And the intersections of hate are really what's kind of astounding, right? It's like they're very good at being intersectional. We talk about it. We need to be better on our side. But, like, it's true. During COVID, uh, we were trying to do abortion activism, but it was incredibly hard because the unmasked, unwashed nutbags were outside of the clinics and making things really unsafe. There was a woman holding a sign outside of a clinic that said, I will not mask my unborn child. <laughs> and I'm like, ma'am, you're wearing pants. <laughs> if you're wearing underwear, you're double masking, so <laughs> you better sue yourself. But we're in a mess. The Supreme Court, it's a mess. You know, I mean, the overturning of Roe, Dobbs, the arguments for Dobbs were, the questions were uh, utterly, Amy Coney Barrett was like, why do we need abortion anymore when people, we just have drop boxes for babies now. <laughs> like, you know, can't you just drop it in the blockbuster slot? Like, what is she even asking? Because <sighs> I'm, ter Clarence Thomas terrifies me. Like this whole Clarence Thomas mess, I am sort of obsessed with the fact that this Harlan Crow situation, you know, I mean, first of all, um, Harlan Crow has this garden called the Garden of Evil, where he has statues of like Stalin and all of these people, and yet he invites Clarence Thomas and Ted Cruz over to his house. It's like, why do you have these statues? You could just put up mirrors. <laughs> it seems easier. Harlan Crow also has one of the largest collections of Nazi memorabilia. He actually has a copy of Mein Kampf. I don't know if it's signed, but he has the copy. <laughs> and he has a yacht. So I'm like, what is his yacht called? The SSSS? <laughs> it's one of my favorite jokes that I've written this year, I'm not gonna lie. The SSSS, um, thanks. But Clarence Thomas warned us the path, right? In Dobbs, he warned us. He wrote in his, dissent, in his opinion that it was like, we should be looking at birth control. We should be looking at gay marriage. You know, should we be looking at interracial marriage? You know, and people like, not Clarence Thomas. And I was like, or yes, Clarence Thomas. <laughs> Think about it. Ginny Thomas is terrifying. 
He probably can't even ask her for a divorce, so he's like, what if I make my marriage unconstitutional? <laughs> That's one way to get rid of the old bitch. Um, I know. I bet they're safe words like, don't tread on me. <laughs> yeah. I think their favorite sexual position would be the overreach around. <laughs> Stay with me. I'll stop with the Clarence Thomas visuals. I'm sorry. You're nice people. What am I even talking about? <sighs> it's just chaos. It's all chaos. The House of Representatives is chaos. What is happening? Matt Gates is in charge, it seems. I know, Matt Gates. You know something? Here's a fun fact about Matt Gates. Did you know that Matt Gates was a strong proponent of the 1619 Project? Yes, until he found out it wasn't a dating site. clown who's mad, right? And it's, I started my career wanting to expose hypocrisy and doing it in corporate media spaces was super hard. Like even at The Daily Show, they'd say to me, you know, you can make fun of people, but we're not activists here. And it was like, that doesn't make any sense. It a, does a people a disservice if you're exposing hypocrisy, but then you don't give them the tools to, with which then they can fight the hypocrisy, right? <laughs> and so, you know, I left there and I did Air America, and it was just kind of the same thing where it was like, don't talk about subjects that um, everybody doesn't want to hear about. Even, this is like progressive people. And it was really felt patriarchal. It's like, if you wanted to talk about abortion, oh, do men want to hear about it? And I'm like, shouldn't they hear about it? <laughs> I feel like no one ever got pregnant from a vibrator. Maybe they should hear about it. I feel like we need to reinvent how we're talking about shit, right? So I had left Air America, and I didn't know what I was going to do next. And I decided that I was going to write a book. So. I drove from Brooklyn in a van with my two dogs back home so I could write a memoir. And as I was wrapping up the memoir, it was right when Wendy Davis was on the floor in Texas, right? The pink shoes. And I don't know if you remember this, but the media didn't cover it. The internet covered it, and people were live tweeting it. And only then did the media pick up on it. And I, myself, as somebody who's had an abortion, who kind of had my privilege really shoved in my face, like, I had my abortion, I moved on. And then I watched Wendy Davis, and then I started doing research. And I learned that week that 27 states dropped that same piece of legislation that they dropped in Texas and nobody was talking about it. And I was like, holy shit, half of America is trying to do this. And no one's reporting on it, no one's talking about it. So I didn't know what to do. So I was finishing up my book and was going back to New York, and I was like, I'm gonna drive back with my dogs and I'm gonna go do fundraisers for all of these clinics on the way home. So I started calling clinics. I'm like, hey, I'm driving across country with two dogs in a van. And they were like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but then eventually they looked me up and they were like, oh, she seems okay. So what started out as six um, shows, gatherings, turned into me traveling to over 100 clinics, doing 100 shows and raising $18 million. But here's the thing, y'all. 
I would do a show, and then I would go visit the clinic. And every other clinic was, they, would, they were like weirded out that I was there. And they were weirded out that I was there because they didn't know how to accept support because nobody was giving it to them. They were left isolated in their communities. There was nobody saying, hey, how can we help you? Are you okay? Do you need help? Do you, is your staff okay? Like, nobody was looking in on them. And I was like, holy shit, this is a crisis. Because if we burn out these folks, and we leave them to provide the care, correct the record, and fight the laws, we're selfish. We're selfish. So I was like, I, I can try to fix this. So I got back to New York, and I, I had a dinner. I made a bunch of chili, and I invited a bunch of activist friends and comedians and producers and writers, and I said, I just got finished doing this thing that was supposed to be 10 days, and it turned out to be six months, and these folks need us to help build them community. So who's in? I want to start an organization, who's in? And everybody was in. So what we did in forming Abortion Access Front was started out where we made videos exposing shit, but we started traveling around the country, and our organization is sort of part Habitat for Humanity, part, um, you know, USO for abortion care. So we do these shows with all those people you saw in the video, and then through the course of the show, we have conversations with the activists and the providers in those towns, and they would talk about what their needs are. And one of the things that I learned that was so profound was if you're providing abortion care in Oklahoma City or Birmingham, well, no places like that now, but <laughs> if you're providing abortion care in hostile environments, you can't get someone to mow your lawn or fix your plumbing or fix your fence or do your roof. And so what we did was we would go in and do some of that work. We'd, we'd redo their gardens. We'd paint their clinic. We'd fix their fence. And then when, when it came time for the show, they would talk about what kind of maintenance need they had. And I'll never forget being in Oklahoma City. And this guy's raising his hand. And, he, and I was like, you have something to say. And he's like, I do. Are you telling me that being an activist means I, I'm hired by them and I get paid and I do their lawn? And I said, yes. You parking your van out in front of that clinic tells the community you support them and tells the clinic that they're part of the community. And... It was astounding. And then the activists would, would have tables in the room, and then you'd have three, 400 people signing up in the community to then help the community. So now they're showing up at school board meetings because there's people to do it. Now they're showing up for the clinic when there's um, you know, any kind of like city council initiative around like protesters outside of the clinics and stuff. They have people to, they can call on to say, can you bring cupcakes over? The staff is just feeling it. And it's incredible. And so we started meeting these pockets of activists and growing these activist communities. And the second thing that we learned, and this part is a happy accident that a bunch of comics did, and I still kind of can't believe it, is let's say we were in Jackson, Mississippi, and we'd be talking to the activists in Jackson, Mississippi, and there'd be a barrage of protesters. They knew all their names. That's Cal. That's Chet. They're from here. And then they would tell us these stories. And then we'd go to Montgomery, Alabama, and there'd be Cal and Chet. And then the people in Montgomery would be like, there are locals, Cal and Chet. And I'm like, wait a minute. Cal and Chet are from Jackson. And everybody's like, OK, where are Cal and Chet from? So A, there was tourism. But B, <laughs> it's great. Um, but B, people didn't actually have a database of who all these people were and what they were doing. So we all started um, Facebook accounts, different names, and we started joining their churches. And we started infiltrating and seeing what their plans were. 
and we started meeting. Since we were traveling, we've been to 35 states. So we're gathering information on all these people in 35 states. And through the course of this past seven years, we've amassed the largest anti-abortion database in the country. And so, um, I would say, you know, late December of 2021, um, we started seeing rumblings in the churches. We're going to go to D.C. We're going to go to D.C. We're meeting in D.C. And then we were like, hey, all these anti-abortion folks are going to D.C. Does anybody know anything about it? Then we started following then we started following. Then, January 5th, we were watching their prayer services. And we're like, holy fuck, Greg Locke is there. Jason Storms from Wisconsin is there. All these people are there. Everybody start rolling on all of these different Facebook pages tonight and tomorrow. And when January 6th happened, these dumb shits <laughs> going live on Facebook and Instagram, and here we are at Abortion Access Front. Snap, pull, snap, pull. 30 people we reported to the FBI. <laughs> a year later, the same dumb fucks go invade a clinic in Tennessee. Same comedians and activists are like, hey, get that shit on tape because you can't invade a clinic. Turns out it's against the law. Actually, it's federal law. It's called the FACE Act. Whoops. 11 people arrested just this week. Their charges were upheld. And we're just the comedians. <laughs> so when the Dobbs case leaked, and everybody, and I'm sure everybody was like, please don't tell me to go march and do nothing else. I think we're exhausted by that. So when the Dobbs leak happened, we knew Roe was going to fall because that's our job. We're traveling around the country. We see the states we know. So we started a, a big, giant program called Operation Save Abortion. And within that, we did a whole day-long training that 10,000 people watched and streamed online with five different areas of abortion activism, reproductive rights, and reproductive justice. It laid out and lays out on our website now all the different ways that people can get involved with differing abilities, how much commitment can you make, what can you do. So we have expanded out our work to not only help the clinics travel, but help people find a home to help protect abortion rights, because there hasn't been a home. And so we are growing and expanding with the goal to be um, a piece of us to be the next act up, to take that direct action, to bring joy and fun to expose hypocrisy. Because it just isn't any fun to just throw spitballs. If I can't throw spitballs, hit a target, and then have people rallying to make sure that the light is shined on them, it doesn't do any good. So to be able to have these tools and create this arsenal for people to have joy, have fun, make change, have hope, it's really the greatest thing I've ever done in my career. And so I feel really honored that you have um, honoring me with this award of this naked man. Um, <laughs> because I feel like it could become to good use in a fight. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Also, I'm going to, oh, thanks. Um, I forgot to say, oh, that's OK. You don't have to stand up. It's fine. No, you're very nice. You're very nice. That's very nice. If you don't sit down, I'm going to be super embarrassed. Please sit down. Um, I'm going to take questions now. I'm going to take some questions, but then also, my table's over here. I want you to come. I'm going to be over there with, I have two people from my team here who are awesome, um, who help run our programs. We'll be blabbing more over there as well, and you can learn all about it. We have a podcast, the whole thing. So after we talk here, 
let's talk over there. So if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm going to take them, unless no one does. Who's going to embarrass me and not? Are you kidding? <laughs> no? Yeah? No? No questions? You have a question. Thank you for not holding me here like I have nobody wants to ask me a question. <laughs> Utterly embarrassing. And you gave me a standing ovation, people. False, false, false. I would like to thank you for creating The Daily Show. It, in my early 20s, um, it made me re realize how interested I was in world affairs and politics and public policy. That's A. And B, how on earth do we get Jon Stewart to run for president? <laughs> Thank you, Liz. I love you. Oh, sure. Um, I don't know how you get Jon Stewart to run for president. I guess, I don't know. He, I mean, he could be a Zelensky. Yeah. He needs to talk more about abortion, though. Hi, Liz. How, Hi. I have two questions. How old were you when you had your abortion? And uh, do you have a book? I do. Um, I've had three abortions. My sisters call me Terminator 3. Yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, when, people, when the anti-abortion people attack me, they're like, how many abortions have you had? I'm like, I don't know. I don't save receipts. They get so mad. <laughs> yeah, it's really good just to like, disarm them with all of it. So 16, uh, 24, and 28. So those are my ages. Um, I do have a book. It's called Liz Free or Die. <laughs> and it's a series of essays that kind of talks about the trajectory of how I went from wanting to be a history professor to becoming a professional clown. How do we get you to run for president? <laughs> oh. I think when you say I've had three abortions in public, you automatically disqualify yourself. <laughs> uh, you know what? Here's the thing. I often feel like I, I'm just a, I, I like to challenge the system. And I think I am better served at challenging the system and instead of being part of it at this point. So I feel like let's influence the other people because the truth is policy comes from us and then they make it. Don't expect them to like make good policy unless we demand it. So I like to I like to hold their feet to the fire. Liz, would you be willing to talk a little bit about your experience when you were 16 when you ended up at the wrong clinic? Oh, yes. Um, so yeah, when I got I, uh, when I got pregnant the first time, um, I was 16. I was. My boyfriend was a hockey player with, you know, a mullet. So a lot of support. Um, and I was Catholic and terrified. And, you know, making bad decisions. You're Catholic, you had sex, you're already feeling like absolutely guilty. And then I was making deals with myself. Like, well, if I have sex and use birth control, that's two sins. So maybe I just won't use birth control. That's one sin. Maybe that, you know, just like a mess. But it was back in the late 70s, um, abortion was legal, but, and it was also when, uh, do you know what the fake clinics are? Have you heard about fake, okay. So um, fake clinics were back then and permeating. And so I was on a bus and super scared and didn't have any money and I saw an ad for a fake clinic that said, you know, pregnancy tests, choices, options. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna go there. And I went, and um, it was like it was like an old Victorian house, um, and it didn't have any medical stuff. It just had a lot of Jesusy stuff in there. Um, and a woman came out f from from a door um, in a lab coat, and you know it wasn't until later that I realized you know the ladies at the Lancome counter also wear a lab coat. You know, <laughs> okay. Um, and so she had me pee in a cup, and, uh, and, um, and I waited, and then she said, it came back out and said, your test is positive, and I thought she meant positive for me. And um, she was like, well, you're going to be a mother. And I was like, oh, my God, I, ca I can't be a mother. I, I don't want to be a mother. And um, she pulled out a book that... Um, looked like those posters that are outside of clinics, you know, with the 
a, with the just mutilated f fetuses. And she's like, and this is your, what will happen if you have an abortion? And I was like, um, I, I can't be a mom. I'm like, I, I have pom-poms in my, like, I, I was just like, I couldn't articulate because I'm scared and 16. And um, I said, I need to, to think about this. And she said to me, take all the time you need. And then I was like kind of scared and I just, she didn't ask me any questions about my life or me or anything. And as I was walking to the door, she said, just remember, Liz, your options are mommy or murder. And I just remember being 16 and thinking like, she doesn't know the first thing about me and in hindsight, I was like, here was somebody impersonating a physician and a person of God, right? And I'm 16 and Catholic. And those are the two people when you're 16 that you rely on all of your trust. And this person deliberately tried to destroy who I was by wielding in front of me and onto me like a cudgel the two people that I would admire the most. And so fuck those people. And the good news is I went, um, I got back on a bus and there was an ad for an actual clinic, but I was so freaked out at this point. I'm like, it wasn't Planned Parenthood, it was an independent clinic. And I was so freaked out, but I was like, I have to go here because I don't fucking know. And I ended up there, and they asked me all these good questions about my life, about what I wanted to do, questions that I could have answered and thought, maybe I do want a parent, but I didn't. And I'm now on the board of that clinic. So that feels pretty good. Yeah. All right, Liz, did you help produce the Colbert Report? I did not produce the Colbert Report, but I did hire Stephen, but I didn't produce the Colbert Report. That was the funniest show ever on TV. It was a great show, for sure. So how, how much fun is it working with Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert? I mean, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. I mean, it is exhausting, and it is fun, and, and at the end of the day, like, you're working 18-hour days, and you're doing nothing else. And for me, it was like, how do I expand that influence and add my activism to it. So it's really fun, but it's completely exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not that tall. <laughs> I could be that tall. So I have a 17-year-old daughter. She is growing up with less rights than I did when I was 17. How do I get her more involved in understanding the gravity of the situation? Because this generation's a little... <sighs> little less attached to the understanding of rights, of law, of civil matters going on. Uh, it's, I feel like I kind of failed a little bit, but it's no, also... It's no, 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 <laughs> here's the thing. You sound like my sister. So here's the thing. <laughs> Thank you. I my think. sister's so cool, right? And same thing with her daughter. And I think that moms... First of all, you're going to turn it over to me. That's And my organization. All yours. I, because I think that a lot of times... No, but it's true. Like, you know, like you can be the coolest parent and like whatever. But, you know, sometimes it's like they don't want to hear it from their mom, even when your mom is the coolest. You know, I, I would say to my sister, she's like, every one of my sisters said, take my kids if they come for birth control. And I said, okay, and they're going to, and I'm not going to tell you. And they're like, great, you know, unless there's trouble. Because, like, whose daughter, who goes shopping with their daughter, right? And their daughter goes, mom, I really want to look sexy in this. I really want to look fuckable. Like, they're not going to. Your daughter says, I want to look fuckable in this? Fuck yeah. Okay. Um, still send her over to me. She's yeah, going to tell me more seriously. stuff. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. But like, she sometimes will listen it's to like politics. there's that border of like, mom, like, I want you to like take care of me, but I also want to be independent and stuff. So, yeah. But I think that like, it's just a, the approach is that send her more fun stuff instead of alarmist stuff. 
and afterwards come over to the table because I can direct you to our website and the stuff that we do and also stuff that other orgs do that feel like very hip and very like fun and also and also have a tone of this is up to you in a way that um, might speak to them just differently than a parent, right? Yeah, because I can tell you're a super cool mom. Yeah. Hi. Hi. This question might be a little off topic. I apologize, but it's personal. Uh, during the pandemic, I, th I think it was 1920, do you remember having a New Year's Eve dance party online with Liz Worley? And if, if you do, would you, and you remember things about it, would you refresh my memory? With about, Liz? Darby Worley? Uh, Dar Darby Worley and, and you, I think, had a, a dance a party. A drunken dance party on New Year's Eve during the pandemic? Yeah. That we unfortunately put on Facebook? Uh, I think and so, And then yeah. fortunately, um, Warner Brothers Music made us take it all down because we were just dancing to songs. So yes, um, it's weird that you would remember that. <laughs> um, I I, I joined I'm a little it. scared. So yeah, it was literally a pandemic. We made food, and then we were like, here's some old funk music. And then we would just dance on Facebook for no reason. I am an embarrassing dancer. And is that what you're talking about? Y yeah. That, yeah. I, I, um, I joined in online, and it was a lot of fun. I feel like you're just bringing up trauma. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So it was so that. funny you bring that, because like that was like some shit that we woke up the next day and it's like, is that all over Facebook? And we were like, indeed it is. And then slowly I would get notifications being like, Warner Music has taken down your video. And I was like, thank God for Warner. And then we, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious of all the things that I've done in my career, that that is the thing that you were like, please tell me more about that weird dance party you did in COVID. I was clothed, but um, I love you for bringing that up. Thank you, yes. That is indeed <laughs> something that happened. <laughs> Thank you. That's hilarious. I mean, it's fine. There's way worse things on the internet. Yeah, definitely worse things on the internet. Um, anyways, just want to say you're super cool. Want to be you when I grow up. How can I uh, help with abortion access? Or I like saying abortion AF. Yeah. That's really cool. I know. Um, that's I the point. On, went on the web website and it said like what special skills do you have like can you tell us this whole group like what are skills you need what are do you so just need anybody do here's you, the thing what 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 can we do to help so what i would say is instead of me saying we need these skills what skills do you have and i can tell you where to put it like and i'm talking about like anything whether you're like good at math you're you can build a fence like what are your skills oh uh, well i just said uh on the web uh, on the thing i said I'm nice, I know how to build spreadsheets, I can bake, and I'm handy, so use Awesome, those are all great things. So we can put you to use on like baking. Uh, like, it, like for example, what would happen is you sign up, you say that, right? Then we have to vet you to make sure that, you know, we vet everybody who signs up, we scour and do that for safety, because, you know, we, yeah, because you just gotta make sure, because, you know, if we're invading places, they're invading places. Um, so then we would say like, where do you live? St. Charles, St. Charles, Illinois. Okay, so then we'd say, we'd look around your community, right? And say, hey, you know what? Brownies over here, they're like having a bad day. And you're like, great, brownies over here. Or like, you know what? Somebody needs some organization of their data. And you're like, great, I do spreadsheets. So it's like, we can hook you up because that spreadsheet thing can be anywhere. We, will, we match up people with their skills locally and then in larger scope stuff. Awesome. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty great. And Kristen's the one who runs the program um, over here. So uh, she's your girl. That was, the that was the last question. Oh, great. Oh, thank you so much. If you have any other questions, I'm going to be over here. Come sign up. We have free stickers. Talk to the team. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You don't have to get up again. You did. You're great. <laughs>